This episode of Full Armor Radio is brought to you by CR101 Radio Network. CR101 Radio Network is a Christian reconstruction internet radio station that hosts and broadcasts lectures, sermons, and podcasts 24-7. You can learn more at cr101radio.com. We're also brought to you by GCS Apprenticeship Program, which is dedicated to training the next generation of Christian teachers so they can own and operate successful and profitable Christian schools. You can learn more at gcsapprenticeship.com. And now to the show. Hello and welcome to Full Armor Radio. I'm your host, John O'Rourke. It's good to be back with you. Today I'll be continuing a little series um, I started doing a few weeks ago on uh, pragmatism in various areas of life. Uh, Last time we did pragmatism in worship, talking about the regulative principle of worship and how it's important to make sure our worship is according to the revealed will of God in the Bible. So you can check that out um, on YouTube or on your favorite podcast streaming service, uh, Pragmatism in Worship. But today we're going to be talking about pragmatism in evangelism. Um, We'll be talking about um, how people have dumbed down um, the gospel or, or have taken upon themselves to um, invent new strategies um, that are not in scripture on how to quote unquote evangelize. And uh, one of the major things I wanted to talk about today is the idea of the altar call um, or even the altar call or altar call slash sinner's prayer, um, that whole thing, which is very, very common in churches. I want to show a couple of videos um, of altar calls and um, also just share share a story or two of my experience uh, with with such things. Um, So first things first, let's talk about real quick, uh, what is an altar call? Well, an altar call um, essentially is something that usually happens at the end of church services where the preacher will be up in the front and he will tell everybody to you know, bow their heads and close their eyes. And then he'll say, you know, if you want to accept Jesus into your heart today, raise your hands and, or come down, walk the aisle, come down to the altar before me and we'll pray together and, and boom, there you are saved. Uh, you can, you can tally up, you can tally up at the end of a service, how many people raise their hands or how many people walk the aisle and boom, you got People who are saved, people who, quote unquote, accepted Jesus into their heart, which I would object to such language, but nevertheless, that's the way that they oftentimes phrase it. So before we get into uh, this seriously, I wanted to first start off by having a little bit of fun. Um, This is one of my favorite, this is one of my favorite videos of um, of an altar call because it's so, so bad. Makes me laugh. It's so cringy. So here's the worst, the worst altar call ever. The reason you lift your hand is because you already believe. You're saying, I believe. And we've just given you an opportunity to confess him before men. He sees you, a little guy in the back. Little guy, I'm not a midget. He's a a child. I mean, I don't want anyone to think I was offending a midget. Yeah, <laughs> that last bit's the best. <sighs> yeah, um, yeah. So that's probably the worst thing that could happen. But that's not that's not really a, um, a good example of what an altar call usually looks like. Got to feel kind of bad for that guy. Um, just another reason not to do altar calls, uh, right there. But uh, here here's one. Um, here's one from from T D Jakes, and and you probably maybe you've heard of T D Jakes. Um, he's he's really a a, a false teacher. Uh, but this ultra call here is is no really no different than what you would get in your average evangelical you know church service thing. So here here's the the last part of, of one of his ultra calls. Um, here's T D Jakes. Listen, you don't have to leave this room without Jesus. Come on down to this aisle. Make a commitment to Christ. Not a casual acquaintance. A personal intimate commitment to Christ right now, if there's one, come right now. 
Anybody? 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 In the 17 years that I have been pastor of the Potter's House, we have never had a Sunday morning that somebody didn't get saved in 17 years. If we made an altar call, somebody came to Jesus. Anybody else? Yeah. You better praise him. I rejoice over one soul. Right. So, so see how there is in, you know, equating of you respond to the altar call, somebody gets saved. He says, you know, we haven't had, we've had somebody get saved every Sunday for 17 years, meaning that somebody has responded positively to an altar call um, every Sunday. So that equating of salvation with responding to the altar call. If you respond to that altar call, boom, you are saved. You are now a Christian. It's just the way it is. That's that's the the doctrine that's being taught here. Now, there's there's many problems um, with this. I want to just start off just by pointing out a few things in Scripture in a minute, and then I want to go back a little bit to kind of the origins of altar calls um, and the theology behind that a bit. So, so part of the problem here is that Essentially, what it's saying is if you come and do this thing, you walk an aisle or you repeat a prayer, that is for sure evidence or it is making known that you are indeed now a Christian. Um, and it's just a fact. So what this does is that it's saying that you can be saved through through this response. And then it's basically a guarantee of salvation. So if you go up and, and respond to the preacher's altar call, you go up to the front and you pray a prayer. Maybe he says, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I accept you into my heart and I'm sorry for my sins or something like that. If you say those words, what you're being told is, now you are a Christian. So what the altar call, this is a key point, what the altar call fails to acknowledge is the reality of false converts. It fails to acknowledge the reality that there are such things as fake Christians. Now, what is a false convert or a fake Christian? It's somebody who professes to be a Christian. They say that they are a Christian, but in reality, they are not. Meaning they're not really, truly born again. This means that they may have responded to, to the altar call and said, yes, I believe in Jesus and I'm sorry for my sins, but it's not true their profession is actually false. It's a lie. So let me, let me point out the reality of this um, in, in Scripture. If you look at, um, first we'll look over here at Matthew, Matthew 7, um, starting in verse, in verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So what do we have here? We have this, this instance here where Jesus is talking about uh, a judgment day that there will be many people. It says many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. Now, let me talk about that first. Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, that re repeating of, of the name there is actually a term of endearment. It's a sign of, of affection. When God calls out to his people in the Old Testament, particularly a lot, he'll say, you know, Abraham, Abraham, you know, Moses, Moses, um, that sort of thing. It's a term of affection, of, of I love you, let me repeat your name. And that's what these people are doing here. I say, I love Jesus, Lord, Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And we do many great things in the name of Jesus, they say. We do many great things in the name of Jesus. But see, none of that matters unless they're truly believers. And what he's saying is that these people are not real believers. That we, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? A mere profession of faith doesn't save you. It has to be a real, a real, true conversion 
wrought by the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit has to make you born again. There's a such thing as being a fake Christian, and we have that here in these in these very um, serious words um, from Jesus. A uh, another another important text I would want to point out here is First John, chapter two. First John chapter two verse nineteen. And we have um, the Apostle John saying this. It says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not, they all are not of us. See, what's he saying here? There are people who were a part of the church, but who left the church, who abandoned the church. They became apostate, is the word. And what that means is that he's saying if they were truly of us, meaning if they were truly Christians, they would have remained with us because true Christians are Christians forever. But see, false converts, they can actually abandon the faith, the faith that they professed because they're not really converted. They haven't really been given a new heart. They haven't really been born again. So we have this, again, this concept of, of being a, a fake Christian here. And then finally, we'll just look at look at one more about false false conversion or, or things like that. In in Second Peter. Second Peter two, we have um, this text. Uh, Peter Peter telling people in the church. He's saying um, in Second Peter. Excuse me. Second Peter one. Excuse me, Second Peter 1, it says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. So there's this concept of, of making your calling and election sure. That we are to make sure that we are in the faith. We are to make sure that we are actually, truly part of God's people. Because there is such a thing as being a false convert, we need to make sure that we are actually saved. Um, we need to beware of, of being, you know, of, of making sure that we're testing ourselves, looking at ourselves and saying, am I really saved? We should know. We should be able to test ourselves by biblical, uh, biblical principles and things like that. And I won't, I won't be talking too much about um, assurance right now. Um, how we can have assurance of salvation, but it's important that we do, that we strive for that so we can know that we are saved. That's what he's saying to do here as well. He's saying, be more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Make sure that you're really a Christian. But what that implies is that there's such thing as a fake Christian, as those other texts did as well. So, one of the problems with, um, again, with the altar call is, is that what it does is it tells people they are Christians merely because they did a thing like walk an aisle or repeat a prayer. There's a few problems with this. One, the altar call is not in the Bible. It is not a, a approved practice of evangelism by anybody in the Bible. God never commands it. It's not something that happens. Um, raising your hand uh, in order to say that you're a Christian is, is not a biblical thing. Repeating a prayer is not done in the Bible either. Um, what we should be calling people to, to, which is what Jesus and his apostles called people to, is to repent of their sins, and the trust in Jesus alone for their salvation. So T.D. Jakes in that thing, he said, I have to give you opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus. Well, he can't give people opportunity. Basically, what we're supposed to do is call people to repentance and faith, and they need to, to do that. They need to respond to that commandment of God to repent and to believe. Now, this is important, is that the sinner will never want to do that. Okay, the sinner in his natural state, apart from the special calling grace of God, effectual calling grace of God, he will never want to be saved. But we have to make his ears hear these words. You have to give him the gospel, call him to faith and repentance, and it's up to the Holy Spirit to convert a person. See, a man cannot convert himself. He must be born again, and the man has no has no control whether he was born or not the first time physically, and he also has no control about being born again are born a second time, spiritually uh, born um, from above, regenerated, being born again. He has, he has no ability or desire to be born again. The Holy Spirit has to do that. But the Holy Spirit makes people born again through the gospel message. And part of the gospel message includes the call 
to repentance and faith in Christ alone. So that's what needs to be done. Instead of saying repeat a prayer and you're saved, say repent and believe and you'll be saved. See, that's what the Apostle Paul said to the Philippian jailer. The Philippian jailer said to him in Acts 17, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. You see, that's what we're supposed to call people to, to faith and repentance. Not saying walk an aisle and you're saved or repeat a prayer and you're saved. That can be very confusing for people and it actually is, is very, very damaging. So this is, this is another problem with the altar call is that it makes, it manufactures false converts. It manufactures fake Christians. What I mean by that is that people say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm, I got saved when I was 12 because I walked an aisle and I repeated the prayer and I wrote my name in the back of my Bible and it says, I got saved on January 15th, you know, 2003 or whatever, you know, and therefore I got saved. I've talked to people in evangelism who they don't, they think they're going to go to heaven because they're a good person, which is false. I ask them if, if, I, if they know what it means to be born again. They don't, so I, I explain it to them, and then I ask them, do you think you're born again? And they'll say, no, I don't think I'm born again. Okay, but get this. They'll say, well, then do you think that you're saved? And they'll say, yeah, I got saved when I was nine. I remember I was in my living room when I re repeated a prayer after my dad. So there's a big disconnect there because this person says they're not born again, but at the same time thinks that they're saved. You see, they haven't understood salvation. They haven't understood conversion or what it means to be born again. It's very, very important that we understand this. One time um, in high school, I played um, on the soccer team, and we went to a tournament. It was a, we were, I was in a Christian school. We went to a, a soccer tournament um, for other Christian schools. Okay, So in this tournament, um, over the course of a few days, we had some chapel services, meaning, you know, all the teams got together in one room and you had a preacher one night and another preacher the next night. And there were two of these, two chapel services um, during the course of this tournament. And there were about a thousand young men in that room. It's really wet. One thousand young men in that room, you know, high schoolers, 16, 17 year olds. And um, basically what we had for both nights is we had one guy, you know, one guy after the, and one guy and then the other guy came and they said basically the same stuff. They went up there and did basically a stand up routine, a stand up comedy routine for 45 minutes. They went up and told jokes, blathered on about this and that. Um, one of them, I don't believe even used any scripture references. The other guy used maybe one or two, but didn't really explain them and just went on and told some stories. So 45 minutes of blathering on about this and that, making jokes and stuff. And at, the, and at the end, they say, okay, everybody close your eyes, bow your heads. And if anybody wants to give their life to Christ tonight, please raise your hand and then come on down. And you had three or four guys do that. And I had to wonder, it made me really mad then. I was a pretty fresh Christian there. And I thought, what is going on here? They didn't preach the word. They didn't preach the word, but then, then told people to come on down and now you're saved. Boom, you just got saved. Now for some of those kids, I wouldn't be surprised if that was their third or fourth altar call that they went down to and responded to. Because people think, well, I went down, but I don't feel like anything's changed now. I got to do it again and again and again and again and again. Because doing an altar call does not convert you. The Holy Spirit converts you. Altar calls cannot convert a person. They can't save a person. And what it does is it makes false converts. It makes people think that they're saved when they're not. And really what that does is it kind of inoculates a person to being receptive of the true gospel. Um, not in an ultimate sense, but it makes them say, well, what, what need do I have for the gospel? I got saved when I was nine, right? Oh, I am a Christian already. I don't, I don't need to hear any of that stuff again. I understand it. I'm a Christian. Now, from my experience talking to people, the, the biggest demographic of, of people I've evangelized has been professing Christians who don't understand the gospel. They're fake Christians. They're false converts. And the reason for that is because they did the altar call, they did the sinner's prayer, and now they're comfortable. Well, I'm, I'm Christian. I'm saved but they don't bear any fruit of being saved. There's no evidence that they are saved. Because one, they don't believe the real gospel. They think they're going to go to heaven by being a good person, which is a false gospel. They're not repentant of their sins, and they live in rebellion against God. Right? Whether an open outward rebellion or just in their hearts or in their private life, either way, they're in rebellion against God with no repentance. But yet, well, I got saved when I was 11. I did the altar call, so I'm good to go. That is a satanic thing, isn't it? See, what does that mean? That means you have a lot of people who are deceived who think, I'm going to heaven because I did that, but they're not actually going to heaven. 
Matthew 7, we looked at it before. Many will say, Lord, Lord, but, I'll, but Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, many people will say, I love Jesus. You know, I, he's my Savior, my Lord, and I, and I went and did the altar call. Many people will say, he sa Jesus says, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? Weren't we faithful servants of you? And he says, no, I don't know who you are. Meaning, I don't, you're not part of my people. I haven't set my special love on you. That's what he means by no. Obviously, he knows who they are because he's omniscient. But what he's saying is, I don't know you. I don't know you intimately. You're not my people. Depart from me. Stirring words. Makes, you know, the hair stand up on my arms. Makes chills get on my back. It's stirring. And what, part of the reason people will say, Lord, Lord, is th and, and, and ultimately get to hell is because of the altar call. This is not this is not something that's not a big deal. This is a huge deal. So because altar calls can make false converts because they they convince people that they're saved even though they haven't really repented of their sins. They haven't really believed the gospel. You you think you look at that video of TD Jakes. All those people are very very emotional. He's very emotional. He's he gets up there and and he he really drives the emotion. And the other one, the cringy one, even though it was really bad, you think of there's that music in the background going. You know, my wife. Um, used to, years ago, used to go to a church where they did this kind of thing. And um, the guy who was who was preaching, I think, he said to her, make sure you really play, play the guitar, play these chords, because it really evokes the spirit in the room, really evokes the Holy Spirit. And you think, what, what in the world is that kind of superstition? Guitar chord, playing a G chord, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't evoke the Holy Spirit. Um, it just makes people emotional. Maybe it will probably get people to raise a hand and walk an aisle. It'll maybe make a, a false convert, but that's the last thing that we want. If you want people to really be saved, we don't want them to be deceived into thinking they're saved when they're not. And that's one of the problems, that's one of the main problems with the altar call. Now, on the opposite side, and this is a much rarer result of the altar call, but it has happened. One of my one of my dearest friends for years really struggled with assurance. He was a real Christian, but really struggled to to know that he really was saved because he didn't feel comfortable doing an altar call. And he thought, well, if I don't do an altar call, am I really saved? I I'm, I'm, must be so arrogant that I wouldn't go down and respond to this altar call. I, I probably am not saved because I wouldn't respond to it. I think, wow, that's, that's so sad. That, now, this is the opposite type of issue is that he's thinking that he's not saved when he actually is, because he's actually repented of his sins and put his faith in Christ, but he doesn't think that he's done the other thing, the altar call, which he thinks is is really important. He learned later on that it's not not biblical and was and was freed from that uh, that burden. But you see how damaging this thing is, and that's what happens when man-made doctrines come into the church. This is not biblical at all. This is totally pragmatic. The idea of an altar call is essentially made to get a most number of people to profess to be Christians as possible. And then you can tally it up and say, look, this many people got saved. Like T.D. Jakes, we've had at least one person saved every single Sunday because they responded to the altar call. Um, that's really, really bad. So I wanted to talk about a few things. The, the origins of the altar call really come from, from Charles Finney. And Charles Finney was a blatant false teacher, um, a total works righteousness teacher. I mean, what's inter interesting about this guy is that he... I've read some stuff from him, and he'll, he'll explain right away, talking about justification, talking about how we're made right before God, the gospel. He'll say, here's what some people believe. And he'll explain the gospel perfectly. And then he'll say, and here's why this is total garbage. And I'm going to refute it. So he understood the doctrine. He just hated it and rejected it. And it's very interesting to read that sort of thing. This is what Charles Finney said. He said, quote, Without new methods, it's impossible that the church should succeed in gaining the attention of the world to the subject of religion. And before I get into these things, I would like to put a little plug in. These, these quotes and some of these questions I want to talk about here um, were put together from, from my friend and pastor, Patrick Hines. And we actually have a video up that's put up just recently called Revival and, Revive, Revival and Revivalism, which is on uh, Patrick Hines, um, his uh, podcast, the Bridwell Heights Pulpit Supplemental. Um, I can probably link to that in the video. It's a good, good conversation. We talked about these very issues, um, but I want to talk a little bit about them here. Um, and a little bit of a different context, um, just a few of these things. So anyway, Charles Finney said, without new methods, it's impossible that the church should succeed in gaining the attention of the world to the subject of religion. See, one, one thing that's the emphasis of, um, of people with this type of theology is that it's all about 
popularity. It's all about gaining the attention of carnal men, men who are unconverted and trying to get them to come and be a part of your, your church services. Um, Finney said, excitement's sufficient to induce men to conversion. You see, that was his, his, his goal, is to have excitements in his services that were sufficient to induce men to conversion. You think, that kind of, sounds kind of, kind of messed up, that excitements would induce men to conversion. Well, that's because Charles Finney's salvation was, or his doctrines of salvation was so bad and so backwards. He believed that man could save himself, that man could convert himself. So this idea, we can have excitement sufficient to induce men to conversion, as if um, the more uh, spectacular and the more bells and whistles and entertaining or interesting a thing is, the more people are willing to be converted to Christ. See, that what that is, is that it's, it's actually um, idolatry. It's actually idolatry. If you come to Christ, quote unquote, for excitements and for pizzazz and bells and whistles, you're not coming to Christ at all. You're coming to your idols, which is excitement and pizzazz, et cetera, et cetera. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 in John 6, and then he crossed over the sea, and many of them followed him over there. He rebuked them, and he says, you don't follow me because you saw the sign, and, and basically saying, not because you believe in me because you saw the miracle I did. You followed me over here because you got a free meal, because your bellies were, were filled. You, you're coming to me for a free lunch instead of coming to me for me, coming to me for salvation. You see, and that's what, that's what the church does a lot today <clears throat> is to get people to come into, um, into become, give their life to Christ, so to speak, but they attract them with carnal means. They attract them with what naturally appeals to man with, with, you know, shows, light shows and concerts and things, things of that nature, exciting things, things that are, um, naturally entertaining to to an unbeliever and then they then they throw a little jesus in there and say oh come to jesus now raise your hand walk an aisle and people might do it because they've had their emotions lifted up maybe the music was really emotional or whatever so finney this this, this stuff comes from charles finney this type of thing comes from charles finney and the so-called second great awakening um so finney saw by the end of his life that the multitudes who streamed forward for altar calls, which at that time was called the anxious bench, um, they were unchurched and deeply hostile to the truth. So he had all these people who, who you know, allegedly became Christians, but then by the end of his life, he realized, well, a lot of these people are really un unchurched and hostile to, to the Bible or to God's word. Um, but no, no surprise there, because you've got people who are, are taught a false gospel, who are told they're Christians, and then they realize this, this is nothing. This is fake. Because what they actually got was fake. They didn't get the real gospel. They didn't get real conversion. And they say, well, Charles Finney told me I was converted. He told me that I was a Christian. And now I, but nothing's different about me. Nothing at all. So this stuff's just a bunch of uh, baloney, right? And they went on and rejected everything just as they did before. Because you can't make up conversion. You can't fake conversion. You can't. You can't really do it ultimately because you won't be repentant of your sins unless the Holy Spirit really converts you. So, um, you know, one question is raised, should we, should we be pragmatic in our church work and evangelism? Um, Patrick Hines had said, he said, a Presbyterian church planner once told him, quote, we're just going to try a bunch of different stuff on Sundays and see what works. And then he, and Patrick said to him, well, how will you determine what works? And he said, if people start coming. See, to them, to these type of people with this type of mindset, this Charles Finney type of mindset, the goal is, you know, seats filled. That's the thing. People in the pews. That's all. That's how you gauge success. That's not the biblical way to gauge success. The biblical way to gauge success is if you are being faithful to God. Are you being faithful to his word? If you are, the results are none of your business. How many people are saved? Is none of your business. I'm going to say that again. The only thing that matters is being faithful to God. How many people are saved by your faithful preaching is none of your business. What I mean by that is you can't save people. You can't save people. You can't make it happen. It's That's the work of God. Look at the book of Acts. Sometimes, boom, through Peter's preaching, thousands of people are saved. Later on, maybe Paul's preaching, you have a few. Many mock Many, many say, oh, this guy's a babbler. But then 
some people say, wow, yeah. Or some people may, that's interesting, or some people will actually be converted. Just maybe a handful here and there. You see, it's up to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves as He wills. We can't control the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit's God. We are His creatures. We are God's creatures. We can't control our Creator. He is sovereign, not us. He can do what He wants. God sits in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. Psalm 115.3 says. So, let's talk about some other pragmatic things here. There was a thing called the Toronto Blessing. Um... And the Brownsville Revival. This is Bill Bright. Bill Bright organized a revival committee in Orlando, <laughs> which is essentially a planned revival, which is total nonsense, makes no sense. Again, the Holy Spirit brings revival. We can't plan it. He does it whenever he wills. So this so-called revival was initiated by a 40-day fast, and revival was supposedly sweeping college campuses, like Wheaton College, for example. Reports said this, quote, people are publicly confessing sins, bringing, bringing things that went between themselves and God, such as cigarettes, drugs, books, and things like that. One confessed that high-style clothes were his issue. The list is extraordinary. Others confessed horrible sexual perversions and pride. This wasn't about theology. This was, this was and is about God, about being reunited with him as one. They came to get right with God, not to learn a bunch of theology, end quote. Reports of these revivals gloried in the fact that there was no preaching involved. One said, quote, The service was turned over to God with a major percentage of people at the altar and repentance based only upon what the Spirit was doing in their hearts, not based on anything some preacher said, as the pastor wasn't even able to speak. End quote. Another, another says, quote, It was as though every ounce of body was being drained and every horrible thought, sin, and wrong I have ever done has, was being atoned. But more confession will be needed for my sins to be washed away. So, got a lot there. This idea of great revival spreading, not through the preaching of the word, but just because people are sitting there and confessing sins, and then the Holy Spirit's working without the word. See, this isn't evangelism. Because evangelism means you're going to be bringing the good news. You're going to be preaching the gospel message. Because it is indeed news. It's a message, something that is communicated through speech. They're glorying in the fact that they're not speaking at all. The people are just, boom, being converted. But you notice, what this, what is this one kid said? He says, every ounce of my body is being drained and every horrible thought, sin, and wrong I've ever done was being atoned. When? Right then and there? Or was it atoned for by Jesus? Well, he wasn't taught that because there was no preaching. He says, but more confession will be needed for my sins to be washed away. So what, atonement or purification by confession? See, this is the problem when you don't preach the true gospel. When you don't preach at all, people get notions. They get, here's, a, here's an emotional thing. Everybody's confessing sins and crying and stuff. And here's this guy. Man, I feel like my sins are being washed away. I feel great right now. But he doesn't understand. It, it seems pretty clear. He doesn't really understand the gospel. He's not saying, wow, it's like, now I understand that Jesus actually paid the penalty for my sins. And I trust in him. I rest in him. That he's my savior. I have nothing to fear. There's no condemnation for me. There's no guilt in me anymore because Jesus has paid it all. Now, that would be a great thing to say. But he's saying, well, I need to confess more before my sins are washed away. Well, no, no, no. The gospel is that Jesus has washed away his people's sins by his blood, by his death on the cross. We are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, it, the scripture says. So you have this idea, well, this, you know, they came here for God, not for theology. What a, what a backwards way of thinking. How do you know anything about God? The Bible, right? You know things by God from his general and special revelation, things he reveals in nature, which, is, which are a few things, and then specifically his special revelation in the Bible. If you know who God is, that's theology. Theology is, is about knowing who God is. And we need theology. It's basically saying we don't need the Bible. Well, God begs to differ. He gave us the Bible for a reason, and it is useful. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, I'd have to disagree with these guys like Bill Bright and so on and so forth, who are saying that you don't really need preaching for revival to happen. Revival happens through the preaching of the word, and the Holy Spirit regenerates people through that according to his will. So, 
Finney, Finney said this, going back to Charles Finney in, in the same line of thinking. He said, quote, instead of telling people to use the means of grace and to pray for a new heart, we called on them to make themselves a new heart and a new spirit and press the duty of instant surrender to God. You see, can man make himself a new heart? No. No. He cannot. Man cannot make himself a new heart. Let me pull up a text. just came to, came to mind. Um, there's a text that really talks about this um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty plainly. It's talking about, um, if I can find it here. Yeah, Jeremiah 13, uh, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopards his spot? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. So that's a rhetorical question. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? The answer is no. Well, then you can't change your heart either, right? And this is why, this is why um, in Ezekiel 36, God says that he's going to have to give his people a new heart himself. Listen to, listen to this text, Ezekiel 36, 26. It says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see, God has to give us a new heart. We can't give ourselves a new heart. We can't convert ourselves. We must be born again. And we are born again by the spirit, not by our own will. Many texts can be cited. John 3, which I'm referring to right now, says that. But John 1, that we are born not of the will of man or not by our flesh or, the, or blood and so on and so forth, but by the will of God, we are born again. Very, very clear throughout Scripture. We can do nothing good when need to be regenerated by the Spirit. So, um, Finney says we need to give ourselves new hearts. Well, it's the opposite. God has to give us new hearts, and we can't change ourselves at all. Um, so, and like I said before, here's another thing about Finney. Finney lamented the failure of his ministry as he saw his many, saw his many converts were not converts at all. And the question is, what's the difference between these altar calls and emotional highs and true Holy Spirit wrought conversion? And the real one of the real differences is, is that true conversion results, and I could say three things here. It result being born again results in somebody actually truly believing the gospel, meaning they are resting in Christ alone for salvation. So if somebody tells me, "Hey, I'm a Christian, and I think I'm going to get to heaven because I'm a good person." That's a sign that they're not born again because they're not believing the gospel. They're trusting in their own good works to save them, which they have no good works, so they'll never be saved by them. <clears throat> so one fruit of being born again is believing the real gospel, actually resting in Christ alone. Two, repentance. Repentance of sin, turning away from your sin, a godly sorrow over sin, which makes you want to be done with sin. The sins that you once loved, now you hate. You've turned your back on them. You are no longer wanting to walk in sin. You're, want, you're wanting to walk in um, with the Lord. And then thirdly, is that related to that, that new desire to obey God, obey God's law out of thankfulness to God, not, not to try to earn salvation by good works, but to walk in a way that's pleasing to God because he's given you a new heart. Remember Ezekiel 36, 27, and he says, I will cause you to walk in my commandments. See, God gives us new desires, desire to do what's right, a desire to love righteousness. That's a result of, of real conversion. So those are the fruits. And Jesus said, you know, you can know a person by their fruits, like you know a tree by its fruits. So if you go around walking around and you see a tree with apples growing on it, you see, well, look, there's apples on that tree. That means that's an apple tree. Well, same thing here. If you see somebody who's really believing the gospel, repentant of their sin and living a life, desiring to please God, they're not going to be perfect, but they're going to strive for obedience. Then those are fruits of somebody's being born again. Now, if any of those things are missing, then that would be bad fruit, and that would indicate that the person is not born again. But see, the altar call doesn't concern itself with these things. The altar call only concerns itself with, can you repeat words after me, raise your hand, bow your head, stand up, walk an aisle, etc. Those types of things. None of those are tests of whether you're saved or not. None of those tests are good tests. None of those things are tests of whether you're saved or not. Um, all the things that I mentioned are tests. Are you, one, do you understand the gospel and believe it? Are you repentant of your sins? Do you have new desires? Do you have a desire for God? 
Really, truly. Do you have a desire for God? Look into yourself. Do you love God? Do you love Christians? First John says, if you don't love the brothers, the love of the Father is not in you. Do you love your fellow Christians? Do you have a desire to see the church be holy? Do you have a desire to be holy yourself? These are good tests. Read First John. That's the point of First John, so that you can know that you're saved. Read the first, read First John and, and go through those tests. See, the altar call ignores that and says, you're a Christian as long as you walk in aisle. And that is so damaging. And, and it's such an evil thing. And that's from Charles Finney's Anxious Bench, which became the altar call that we know and hate today. So with that, we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. Um, thank you for, for watching this one. I want to just say that um, if you're not already subscribed to the YouTube channel, please go to the YouTube channel and, and subscribe to it so you can keep up with the videos. Um, this These types of podcasts, Full Armor Radio podcasts, are on YouTube as well as every podcast streaming thing that there is out there. But also on just on audio for podcast streaming things, I also have evangelism encounters where you can listen to me talk to uh, real people um, about the gospel people from various religions and backgrounds and worldviews and hopefully that'll help you see um, the true gospel Uh, if you are a christian maybe help you to understand how to better evangelize people Um, it'll also if you're not a christian maybe something you can listen to to hear the gospel and hear um, how it can be explained maybe maybe some of your questions are the same questions that the people i talk to have so i want to encourage you to check those things out and, and share them with your friends and um and just really think about, um, you know, I guess the theme of today is thinking about whether how we whether we're really saved or not, and really thinking about, you know, what's true good evangelism, sharing the gospel, the true gospel, how Jesus accomplished salvation, and calling people to repentance and faith in Christ alone. If you have questions for me, um, you can contact me. You can go to our my website fullarmorministries.org. Um, armor is spelled A-R-M-O-U-R, so fullarmorministries.org. There's a contact section of the website. It'll go straight to my email, and I can get back to you. If you have any questions for me or would like to talk about anything, um, please let me know. So thank you again for, for watching and for listening, and God bless you.